Good morning. How are you feeling? Feeling good? I feel great. I'm George Johnson. I'm your facilitator today. And uh, it was such a beautiful day. What, where would you want to be other than inside in this room learning about <laughs> prostate cancer, huh? Uh, it's going to be a good day for you. We got a really good uh, subject and a good speaker to address it, an expert in the field. Thanks. I want to welcome you and uh, to the informed prostate cancer group. That's our, our role here is to inform you so you're informed about your prostate cancer. And uh, the reason you need to be informed is so you can ask your doctor the questions you need to have answers to. So we want to thank uh, SBP, as they now want to broadcast uh, the name of this organization, the wonderful facilities. If you are in the need of uh, other facilities, it's out the back door and down the hall <laughs> to your left. Okay. Uh, you, excuse my hesitation because I don't see on the screen here what you see, so I have to look around and see what this is and remind myself. Hey, look at these wonderful volunteers. Uh, we, today we got, yeah, let's applaud them. I want you to know that the salary is pretty meager, non-existent really, but the benefit program is great for us to be able to be of service to you and in the community. And we got Lyle here, and Gene's going to say some words, and I'm the next person. Bill Manny's in the back there. He's the one that makes the DVDs that, uh, for the talks. I uh, want to emphasize that point. You can get these for 10 bucks. Uh, you don't have to take notes, and you get the visuals and all that. And we make a f some money off of that. But uh, uh, thank you, Bill. He's also a director. Uh, John Tassie, not here. Bill Bailey is back. He's right over there, a librarian. You got any questions? And, and we got the DVDs and the books. And some are for rent and for, some are for sale. And, uh, and then Jim. Jim's the guy with the smile. There he is. And we got another person coming in to the door there, Jim. There he goes. We got another member. All right. Hey, if you want to volunteer, and I'm going to make a plug at the end, we, we uh, you may be surprised. We're kind of getting on your years. And we need some, uh, some more volunteers to help us out. And as I said, the benefits are great. So uh, give a plug for you uh, people to want to participate. We're all kinds of help, particularly uh, uh, in uh, supplementing our, our for, uh, for Gene. And uh, so keep that in mind. Okay, the newcomer package. Uh, Gene uh, gave you newcomers a packet, a really good uh, primer on prostate cancer, so you all have a good baseline uh, aspect about the program. <laughs> It's got a yellow front page to it. I'd like you to fill it out. And uh, if you fill it out and su uh, submit it, you'll get a friendly call from Gene and uh, encouragement, and, and he's available to ans answer any of your questions. Okay. Uh, what we do for you here is uh, we have a website lost something here. Let me go back. Okay, here's our purpose. We share patient-focused experience on becoming your own case manager through informing, networking, and caring. Uh, this is how we inform you. You have to be your own case manager. Your doctor is your doctor. He's not your case manager. He's got 2,000, 3,000 or more cases not thinking about you until maybe hopefully 10 minutes before he calls you in the examining room. So you need to manage your case. When should you get another PSA? Uh, keep a list of questions. Uh, bring your questions to the meeting. Uh, write down the answers. One good suggestion, if it's a complex visit for you, take somebody with you. Take your spouse or another friend. They're going to hear things that you don't hear. And. Uh, that's how you manage your case. Keep a copy of all your records uh, and ask for them. They're yours. They belong to you. So ask your doctor or the laboratory for those. But we're not a substitute for your doctor. Uh, but we may help you ask, uh, come up with questions you want to ask your doctor. Okay. 
what do we do for you? Uh, we have a, a wonderful website. Uh, John Tassi is our webmaster on that. We got this uh, very unique library of DVDs, books, and papers. We got a newsletter. Uh, Gene got a nice compliment this morning. from Somebody said that uh, really, uh, really a great newsletter, uh, this issue. So thank you. Uh, Gene's been working very hard on that. It's full of good information and some questionable jokes. I don't know how good they are. They're old jokes, so you might like them. They're old jokes, okay. But we got some new information there on new research and things like that. And we have an outreach program for new members. Particularly what's important is the outreach to get men out there to get their PSA test. You, if you don't want to know about early detection, don't get a PSA test. Uh, the PSA test is really for early detection. Uh, as many of you know, there's no precursors or uh, information uh, or pain or bleeding uh, early on for early detection. By the time you get those pains or, or blood, it's, it's pretty late in the program. And so that's why early detection for cancer is so important. And uh, the, the task force that doesn't recommend it as being unnecessary, that's okay. If you don't want early detection, if you want late detection, uh, wait. Okay, we have monthly meetings, and uh, what's our next meeting? Okay, here's the subject. What is PSMA, and why is it relevant to prostate cancer? You all know what PSMA is, right? Raise your hand if you know what PSMA is. There we go. Boy, the rest of you better come to this meeting next month, because <laughs> it's a new technology. It's very important. I hid down the bottom what it stands for, prostate-specific membrane antigen. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Really, it's about new diagnostics and new treatment. And it's a kind of a breakthrough on prostate cancer, so I'm sure you're going to want to hear about it. And if you're a UCLA fan, you'll get double. Okay, let's get your participation in raising your hand. Please raise your hand in response to these questions. How many are here for the first time? Welcome. Hey, look at all those people there. Talk. We want to network with you. Uh, what you might want to do is when we raise our hand on treatment, and you, you're interested in treatment, and you see a hand of a neighbor go up, and you want to maybe ask that person, how, how was it, what happened, and so forth. Uh, and uh, okay, fill out that yellow page too, please. How many have been recently diagnosed in the last six months? Okay. Uh, hope you're learning here. And how many have had prostate cancer for up to one year? Okay, just uh, quite a few there, more than I thought. Okay, up to four years have had prostate cancer. Look at that. And now let's go five to ten. See you newcomers, see how many hands are going up? Okay, 11 to 15 years. How many hands we got up here? All right. All right, anybody higher than 15? I got 18. Okay, let's start over here, sir. Lyle, how many years? 16. 16. Anybody be 16? Okay. How many? 20. 20. Anybody be 20? <laughs> okay. Well, you win the award, you get to come back next year. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now we're, let's do some uh, treatment surveying. Some of you have had a multiple of treatments, and so every time you, uh, I mention it, raise your hand again. Okay, let's start with active surveillance. You've not had treatment yet, but you're on active surveillance. Let's see how many hands we get on that. See how many now? We're, we're getting more of those hands up uh, compared to previous years. This is now the preferred uh, approach to start your prostate cancer program. How many have had prostate surgery of all types? That used to be the gold standards. Let's see what happens when they raise the hand. How many have had radiation? See, we, now we have more people getting radiation than uh, surgery. Uh, ADT, hormone therapy. Uh, you see those hands go up. I don't know if you notice. Gene keeps his hand up all the time. He's had all of these. And uh, well, Chuck uh, has also. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chemotherapy. 
Ms. Chuck. Okay, chemotherapy. Uh, new treatments, how, how many are on uh, new treatments, uh, HIFU? Uh, uh, okay, okay, how, uh, he's on all of them. How many are, what, what are you at? Provenge, how many have on Provenge? How's it working for you? <coughs> it seems to, right? Okay. Uh, we've had in the last few years a number of new treatments. The unfortunate thing is that they tend to be very expensive. Okay, but effective. How many have had, after having a primary treatment, how many have had recurrence? How many times? Uh, my hand goes up on that. Uh, and that was very difficult for me because uh, I thought I was uh, cured. After 10 years, my PSA jumped up. I had radiation, and I came in this room. And, uh, but I was sent to a urologist before to get a, a treatment. It was a shot. And uh, I asked him, should I join a support group? He said, no. No? Uh, why not? They're a bunch of whiners. <laughs> Initially, I thought it was the red wine. No, no. The, <laughs> He thought you were a bunch of whiners. You don't hear whining in here. You're, you hear enthusiasm and good questions and so forth. So encourage others to uh, attend because I think you get a, a positive feeling about this program and bring uh, others who are concerned about their prostate cancer into the program. All right, how many are undecided about the next treatment they may have to face? That's me. <laughs> Very good. Now. We're going to be hearing about uh, something related to side effects. I'm a perfect example of side effects. And now I know why they call it side effects. I had that shot from my urologist. And I'm one of the 5% that shouldn't have it. I had a heart problem. In my uh, one afternoon, my whole right side was numb. I had a stroke. Fortunately, it was uh, over in about uh, three days and so forth. But uh, that was a side effect. Uh, it affected my right side, but it's, I'm okay now. But uh, the thing we have here is in this treatment, there's bound to be maybe some side effects. Let me show you from the PCRA uh, conference uh, of uh, a year ago. And what we have here is uh, showing the various side effects. And we're going to hear something about the first five. and I. I'm going to ask you, I've had all of these, I've got them all. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so our, our doctor here can uh, get a sense for what well, your interest and needs are. How many have had uh, as a result of, you see here we have surgery, which seems to have the most, radiation fewer, ADT is generally given to people who had the first two treatments if, in, after recurrence, and so uh, these are the uh, uh, elements that probably just restricted to ADT. And uh, the AS is active surveillance. Uh, we put that down. This is not on the PCRI chart. And it has no side effects other than down at the bottom, some anxiety, because you're going to have frequent tests now and then, and you're not sure. And, uh, and uh, the day before you go see your doctor about that test, you have some anxiety. But uh, otherwise, it's the best program to pick if it's appropriate. So uh, let me ask you if you've had uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. Raise your hand. I've had that. Okay. There we go. Uh, libido loss. Had that. Okay. Penile shortening. That's something that doctors don't mention. Uh, that is particularly noteworthy for, for a surgery. Uh, incontinence. Okay, and if you don't have that, maybe you have some urinary frequency. Uh, that, if you're old, you got that anyway, see, okay. Uh, then we got the things that uh, don't need to go down that list here. Let's see, uh, you may not be aware of bone loss, but that's why maybe your doctor wants to have a, 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 a test of that. Uh, hot flashes, how many of you uh, still on fl hot flashes? I have them, okay, fatigue. Yeah, 
Uh, if you're on ADT, you tend to have some fatigue and uh, anxiety. This is part of our program is to reduce anxiety. Okay, now, here's where we need your support. This is our program, and now uh, let's pass the baskets. Uh, we need some money to run this program, and uh, donations are tax exempt. Uh, if you're unsure how much to give, I just want to emphasize, uh, we're interested in uh, paper money with zeros on it. Uh, $10 is a nice looking uh, piece of paper for us. You want to have some with more ze than one zero, you're free to do that because it will be tax exempt. We're not affiliated with any medical or religious organization. And uh, the money we have, it doesn't go for anything that we spend on ourselves, it's for the program. So you can be assured of that. So, uh, okay, I'd like to turn, here's our, here's our agenda. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Lyle, and then Gene will have a few comments, and then we'll have our speaker. Okay. Morning. For those of you that read the newsletter and, uh, and your emails, Recently, Gene sent out an email that said that he was resigning from IPCSG. So I want to calm all your fears. He's not resigning. He's just uh, reassigning some of his duties. And primarily, what we're looking for is someone that's interested in our newsletter and has some experience, preferably, but if not, and you have some interest in it, Gene is willing to spend the time to teach you. So it's a big deal to this organization to have that newsletter and to continue the, um, the good work, because Gene has taken it from me scribbling on a piece of paper to a very professional newsletter. We're very proud of Gene, and uh, I think uh, we all want to thank him for his service, and um, he'll get his reward in heaven. Thank you. Okay, um, I want to say something. Our dinner cruise is coming up on September 15th, for those of you that were there last year. It's a, uh, a big party on a big boat. We go out in the bay, we have hosted cocktails, dinner, music. Sometimes people start dancing after they start drinking. <laughs> and um, the information is all in the newsletter and on our website. So I want to remind you of that. We've already started accepting reservations, and uh, it's going to be a sellout. There are only 150 seats available. It's uh, sponsored by some uh, nice people in San Diego. UCSD is a big promoter of it, as is uh, the Nice Guys and uh, Super Shuttle. And I'd like to introduce Patty Fuller. Patty, please stand up. Patty is our um, philanthropic fundraiser assistant. She came to the group through Sanford Burnham here at the Institute. She was previously involved with them. And uh, we have a marketing program. If you've noticed our ads in the paper lately, they are directed more at wives of prostate cancer men. And uh, let's team up. Jean has created the ads. It says, help your husband fight prostate cancer. So we're doing uh, a marketing in a little bit different way. Okay, so um, uh, this is my, my own ranting, but I'd like to tell you new guys that if you haven't done it, get your testosterone measured. Testosterone is a big subject in uh, prostate cancer treatment, and uh, many times a new guy will go into a doctor's office and they'll shoot him with something and shoot a, give him a shot and that is a castration drug, chemical castration, which reduces your testosterone. And if you, you keep your testosterone low long enough, it starts to have really serious bad effects on you. So it's possible to maintain your testosterone and still fight prostate cancer. So remember to do that. Just tell them you want your testosterone measured, and you should try to keep it up above 500. 
and you'll notice the difference. Okay, so that's my bit for now. So I get to introduce you to someone who is very special to me and to this group. Uh, I met him through A.J. Munt and Kevin Murphy, two doctors at UCSD. They brought him to dinner one night, and uh, we really hit it off. He's a urologist. He was uh, trained, came out of Chicago, and uh, grew up as a sport fisherman, and he moved to San Diego. And so originally, I helped set him up with a sport fishing trip. He went once, and he's so successful, or so busy, I should say. I don't know how successful it is. But he, uh, he, he works virtually seven days a week, and I have called him many times in emergencies, and he says, tell him to come right down. Uh, you're not going to find many doctors in today's world that have that kind of concern for their patients. So he's a doctor's doctor. And as a urologist, he does lots of stuff. He does a lot of uh, sexual surgeries and uh, repairs, as well as uh, doing a lot of uh, TERP, which are transurethral resections, which are a urethral problem. I mean, a lot of you guys have had them. You know all about them. So I'm not going to say a whole lot more about him, except that he's a special doctor, and um, he's the doctor that I send people to. So this is Dr. John Grimaldi. He practices in Chula Vista, and he's going to take over. Come on, John. All right, thanks. I got one here. Is this OK? Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. OK. Gene, would you help me one more time to get back to where I need to be? Yeah. Sorry, pal. Well, uh, while Gene's helping me here, uh, my name is John. I'm a urologist. I'm from uh, Chicago, born in Detroit, moved to Chicago when, we, when I was little, so basically raised in Chicago. Um, and uh, took my first job out of my residency in a small town in southern Indiana. Um, so it, by hook or by crook. So anyway, I practiced there for about three years. Um, and when I came out of my residency, I was, I was met by this group of guys who said, you know, we've got a great practice down here. You can do pretty much as much as you want. And they said, well, I sounded good to me and my wife and I decided to move there. Um, and they said, well, what do you want to do when you, when you start practicing? The one guy said, I really like doing female reconstruction prolapse. The other guy says, I really like doing stones. And I said, I just, I want to work. You just put it in front of me and, and I'll start doing it. So nobody there had really done any sort of reconstruction. Um, meaning for, for men. So erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence, um, urethral reconstruction, all that kind of work. And so um, I had been trained in that in my residency, and I enjoyed the work. And moreover, I really enjoyed the results. The, um, it's amazing when, you, when you're able to help somebody in that regard. It's, it's really a life-changing event. So I started doing some of these penile implants, and one turned to two, to five, to a thousand, um, and it just snowballed from there. It was by no, by no design of my own um, other than uh, these guys needed some help and i type of person that can't say no. So um, I just started doing that. There's a doctor, probably one of the most well-known doctors in the world for, for um, incontinence and impotence is a guy named John Mulcahy. He was at University of Indiana, Indiana University and he had retired and he was gone for maybe three, four years before I got there. So there's a major void in the people who are actually getting and receiving treatment for these types of problems. And so when I kind of put my hand up and said, yeah, I'll do it, I started getting things that I couldn't even imagine I would have operated on uh, just a year before. So I was getting patients from Germany and Japan and all over the world that were flying in because they said, oh, there's a new guy. Well, it w again, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't by design, they just thought, Oh, this is the new guy in town, so he must be great. I'm not that great, so. Um, so, without further ado, uh, the topic of discussion for today, and, and I'm kind of tethered to my 
to my screen here because this isn't the PowerPoint that I can move with the, with the, uh, with the button, so forgive me for not wandering around. Um, we're gonna talk about male urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. So why would I do this? So it's a weird, it's a weird business, and I kind of explained to you how that came about. So there's way too many guys out there who have these problems. They don't really have any resources for how they're going to um, even talk to somebody about this. So it's a truly underserved population. Um, I'm pretty passionate about the work. I'm confident in my abilities to, to help people out and. Um, Men, moreover, um, need an advocate for their health. Women, women um, do a wonderful job about that. Men, men don't. So groups like this are unfortunately all too uncommon. So today's topics, we're going to talk about incontinence, some statistics about incontinence, um, the different types, why it happens, how do you diagnose it, and how do you treat it. Um, so very simply, Involuntary loss of urine is, is the description of urinary incontinence. So some of the statistics about incontinence, 9% of American males between 18 and 97 have uh, incontinence. This, this translates to around 9 million men. And these are old statistics. So this is uh, 2005. Um, you know, these numbers are growing and growing and growing. So 13% of men over the age of 60 will report at least one episode of incontinence. So there's several different types. First type is something called stress incontinence. That's when you're usually continent, walking around, but if you cough, sneeze, or lift something heavy, you're gonna leak urine. That's, that's uh, something that we commonly see in women as well. There's urge incontinence where you get this urge to go to the bathroom and you gotta go right now or you're gonna wet your pants. Um, there's a, a mix of those two. There's something called overflow incontinence. Overflow incontinence is if you could imagine I'm holding a pitcher of water that's completely full, and you asked me to run from that side of the room to the other, I'd probably spill half of that pitcher. Overflow incontinence is for men who can't completely empty the bladder, so they're constantly leaking and leaking and leaking. Um, total incontinence is, say, the sphincter muscle or, or something neurologically happens where you have zero control. This one is, this last one is the one that, that we really need to um, probably train our new doctors to, to take a good hard look at. Functional incontinence is when, um, say you have a broken leg or you can't get up or, or you have all, um, Parkinson's disease or something that doesn't allow you to go from one place to the other very quickly, that's functional incontinence. Say I had, I had two broken legs, I couldn't get to the bathroom, I might leak urine. So we see this as a, uh, um, a factor in lots and lots of men's incontinence, it's one that's, that's oftentimes it's, uh, it's, it's overlooked. So you come to the doctor, you've got a big prostate, so on and so forth, the doctor says, yeah, I can do that, that's no problem. And they do the surgery and then they say, well, dad's still leaking. And they say, oh, well, that's right, he doesn't get out of bed, does he? So you, you, you really need to think about who you're operating on as an individual, as a human being. Um, because everybody has different problems. Um, so why do men become incontinent? So BPH, which is a large prostate, that's probably the most common. Surgery for BPH, surgery for prostate cancer, uh, trauma, radiation occasionally, neurologic disorders, and something called stricture disease, which is scar tissue in the urethra. Um, so this is a very busy slide, where's that thing? So this is showing, this up here is showing the spinal cord and the nerve roots. This is the bladder um, um, and the, the male anatomy here. So this little pink sign is showing a urethral stricture. So these are different locations in the human body that could cause uh, incontinence. This one here is the prostate. This is a bladder stone. This is showing the inside of the bladder. This is pointing to the bladder and showing that some drugs can do it. In diabetics, the nerve roots um, are, are what gets affected. Tabes dorsalis affects the, the, the dorsal horns. Spinal cord tumors, polio, um, what does that one say? Di uh, multiple sclerosis. So as you can see, a uh, million different things that can cause it. So how do you diagnose it? Like with anything, and this is, this is again, this is where I, I think that um, a lot of doctors have the, the the biggest problem is you can get the diagnosis just from sitting 
and talking to your patient like a normal human being, 99% of the time you can walk out of the room with the correct diagnosis. Um, after which you can get a good idea of what's going on. You want to do some tests to kind of verify it. Eurodynamic studies is kind of like doing an EKG on the bladder. It gives us some functional information about how it's, how it's, uh, how it's working. Cystoscopy is looking inside the bladder with a telescope. I do it for almost every man who's a patient of mine. The reason for that is it's, a, it's an extension of the physical examination. It's fast, it's easy, you can do it so that it doesn't hurt and it's gonna give you a, a ton of information. Um, so once you diagnose it, what's, what does that mean? Okay, so you're incontinent, but that's a gray scale. Um, mild incontinence, and this is, this is a very broad gray scale because there's also how you feel about it or, or what the, what the, uh, how it affects your life, more importantly. So we consider mild to moderate as one to three pads a day, moderate three to five, and greater than five pads a day. But again, that's not, that's not every person. One guy may wear the same pad all day long. And we talked about functional incontinence and you would say, well, that's gross. Why would somebody do that? Well, some people can't move as well as you can. And so you really have to drill down and figure out what exactly these numbers mean. Um, so how do you treat it? Um, well, once you know what the cause is, the next thing to do, if you're going in a stepwise fashion, the very easiest thing to try first, the one that's the least invasive would be behavioral modifications. Having them urinate every couple of hours, try to empty their bladder. Um, and this shows some improvement, not very much. Drugs for male urinary incontinence typically don't work all that well. Um, so if a man has BPH or overflow incontinence, just like we talked about, usually the problem is either a stricture which is scar tissue in the urethra or a large prostate. And depending on the age group, you can kind of parse that out. If it's a guy who's say 50, 60, 70, it's usually BPH. If it's a younger man, you're probably looking at some sort of stricture disease. My dad is 72. He got his prostate operated on uh, last year. And so I, I know my day is coming. Um, so the, um, some of the things that can cause uh, that we can use to uh, treat some of the surgical options we can use to treat uh, to treat BPH are the transurethral resection of the prostate or the rotorooter. That's where you go in there and you open that up. And we can speak a little more about this later. It's personally what I feel is the very very best, but it's one that's probably done less and less and less. We've developed these laser prostatectomies. It's nice because it's an outpatient surgery. You can typically send the patients home the same day. And then there's an open uh, suprapubic prostatectomy. And that's where you make an incision like you would for doing a radical prostatectomy. And you leave the, the capsule of the prostate, but you enucleate the entire inside and pull it out. It's like taking out the inside of an orange, but leaving the peel there. Um, Okay, so for whatever reason, if, if the man has urinary incontinence, and I'm gonna focus specifically on radical prostatectomy, um, you would really have to take a look at the, at, the, um, at the anatomy, but sometimes in surgery, whether it's with a robot or open surgery or what have you, those, the muscle that, that keeps us dry, that external sphincter can be damaged. And um, if that muscle is not functioning, that person is going to be incontinent. So some of the options for, for treatment would be male sling and artificial urinary sphincter. So once again, um, let me look at my next slide so I don't jump the gun. Okay, so, so and how, how, do you, how do you choose who gets what? Well, a, a male suburethral sling is good for men who have, say, had um, a radical prostatectomy, but they still have good function of, the, of that muscle. The good, good test for that is you have somebody go home and have them start urinating, say, in the shower, and if they can stop that stream, you know that muscle is functioning. I do it in the office with the scope. I say, okay, I want you to run through this maneuver, and you can see that muscle squeeze down. So if the muscle is squeezed down, you know that they still have decent function, you can probably get away with a sling. If that muscle is gone, 
then these men are going to need artificial urinary sphincter. And I can show you a little bit more about that here. This is what a sling looks like. It's a piece of mesh that goes underneath the urethra and kind of repositions everything that our good doctors have taken out of position by doing your surgery in the first place. So these slings can kind of help push things back into their normal position. It takes a little bit of stress off of that actually functioning muscle so that it can do its job a little bit better. Um, the artificial urinary sphincter, we've got three different parts. And this is all inside the body. There's nothing on the outside. Um, there's a reservoir full of water. It's called a pressure regulating balloon, which means it keeps fluid always inside this cup and squeezes down that tube just, as, just like you would if you were uh, holding your penis so you didn't leak. And then there's a pump that's in the scrotum. So when a man wants to urinate, he pumps this. It releases, it pushes the fluid out of this cuff and back into the reservoir. When that happens, this is open, man's allowed to urinate, and then just with time, the pressure is gonna reverse and, and fill this cuff back up. So this, for urinary incontinence, is the gold standard. The, very, the downside, unfortunately, and there is a big downside, is that the shelf life is like five to eight years because for several different reasons. Number one, it's a mechanical, mechanical device. Devices can fail. The second thing is, is when you have uh, something that's tight around a muscular structure with, that, with, with blood vessels, it's going to atrophy. So if today it's this tight, in a year, this, the urethra may have shrunk down, and now it's only that tight. So when, when there's no longer pressure being put from this cuff on the urethra, then it's time to, you have to operate again. So you have to look at this particular man and say, okay, how old are you? How bad are your symptoms? You gotta be very upfront and say, okay, you may need another surgery every five years or more, depending on, on the disease. So the take home message here is call your doctor, get, get, get a couple of opinions. And that's why I applauded when, when everybody said, the people who raised their hands, who said they were undecided about um, getting their prostate cancer treated. I, I applaud that because I don't wanna see anybody get bullied into uh, to treatment. That's the very last thing you wanna do. What I tell my patients is, when I diagnose them with prostate cancer is, I don't necessarily care what you do or, or how we get it done or how we're gonna treat your prostate cancer. I give them every available option, at least that I know of, and there may be things that I don't know these days that I would send somebody down the line for. But when that person is going to make that decision, I, you need to make that decision not under duress. As long as it's something that you're comfortable with, that's, that's the right decision. I may have some ideas about what, you know, what I think is best, but ultimately, it's, it's you. It's not my body, it's not my life. Okay, so usually the showstopper here is erectile dysfunction. That's the one that everybody comes to see. So we'll talk about some of the same, same concepts as we did with, with, um, with urinary incontinence. What is ED? It's the um, inability to achieve an erection that's firm enough for sexual intercourse is the basic definition. But it also means that it's no longer satisfactory to you. If it's not what it used to be, there's lots and lots and lots of things that can be done. And it's important to get that checked out because it doesn't just mean that you have an erection problem. There could be many other different things. This could be the canary in the mine shaft to show you that you know, your heart is not functioning the way that it used to. Your blood vessels aren't functioning the way that they used to. Um, but it doesn't mean that you have to have no erections. So how does this work? It's a, busy, it's a busy slide because it's a, it's a busy thing that happens within the human body. Um, it's complex interaction due to sexual stimulation, whether that be uh, tactile or verbal or what have you. Um, so the brain, the nervous system, the heart, the blood vessels, hormones all need to work in concert to get this thing to happen. The arteries will deliver blood to the penis and the veins are then squished down as, the, as that tissue expands. The veins that let the blood out get closed down and it allows the blood to get trapped in there. So then after ejaculation, that, that process reverses itself. The veins open up, the arteries shrink down, and that's when you get what's called detumescence or it goes down. Um, because this is not, not um, on PowerPoint and we're just looking at the slides, it doesn't function, but these should pop up. 
So this is looking at the flaccid state of the penis prior to erection. So this is the urethra, the big tube at the bottom, and these are the corpora cavernosa, which is the spongy tissue that fills with blood. What, what are a little more difficult to see is these little dots on the outside. So those are the, those are the veins. And those are very, very important. It's probably another thing that your average doctor doesn't really know all that much about. So during erection, you get engorgement of blood into these tissues. And in between this slide and this slide, you can see that all the blood is inside. But these little veins are pressed down. So when that part of erection is, is interrupted, that's called venous leak. So um, venous leak. Um, you can have you can have trouble with getting erections because there's not enough pressure, and, and we'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. But venous leak is uh, people can have uh, something called atherosclerosis. That's the hardening of the arteries. It also happens in the veins. So if you can imagine that blood is rushing into this area and that tissue needs to close off the veins, if those veins are hard uh, and they're no longer compressible, the blood will flow in, but it'll flow right back out again. And so you may know of a situation where you get an erection but it doesn't last or it's never hard enough. That's probably venous leak. Um, sorry. Again, these are old slides. So there's an estimated 30 million American men with erectile dysfunction. This, this number grows, grows daily. So that's one in 10 men worldwide. So 50% uh, of the men with diabetes will have a diagnosis of erectile dysfunction typically within 10 years. Um, the incidence increases with age. Um, this is my favorite one here, is it, at least it was. Every seven seconds at the time I wrote this slide, a baby, a baby boomer was turning 50. So that's a huge population of men um, with these issues. And if you smoke, you have a 50% 50, 50 higher likelihood of, of getting uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, what are the causes? Anything for prostate cancer, anything. Radiation, Lupron, surgery, cryo, uh, HIFU, I, I, you name it. If, if you're getting treated for prostate cancer, chances are that's going to affect your erections. Um, anybody who says that they're gonna do a surgery or something where they're gonna spare the erections is probably lying to you because they don't know what the outcome is gonna be. And I can, again, I can explain that a little bit more. I've done, I don't know how many radical prostatectomies I've done, but not once, not one time have I ever seen the nerves that are responsible for erection, not once. Um, and I've operated in centers all over the country from the best universities to the smallest operating rooms you can imagine. And I, I, have, and I defy any surgeon to tell me oh yeah, that's the nerve, because those are structures that you cannot see when you're doing that operation. Um, diabetes, smoking, vascular disease, Peyronie's disease, which is scar tissue, uh, trauma, neurologic disorders, hormonal problems, medications, um, and there's psychological ED. That's th that, that psychological ED is more like performance anxiety. It doesn't happen very much, and we've got medications these days that'll knock that out of the park, so that's, that's really, of, uh, that's, that's really not an issue for today's discussion. Far and away, the most, the most important thing about erectile dysfunction is the psychology of erectile dysfunction. What does this do to men? It's, um, and it's the single most important issue regarding treatment and or avoidance of treatment. So it's depressing, it's isolating, it's completely embarrassing. Um, it's marginalizing because men think they're the only one who has this issue. Well, I just showed you the slides that it ain't just you. It's, it's probably every man on this earth at some point in their life. Um, and the thing that I hear over and over and over and over again is that you probably don't feel like a man. It's the things that we recognize from the time that we're very, very young that makes you a man, and then that's gone, and that's, that's a very difficult thing to deal with. So... Men don't tend to talk about erectile dysfunction. We kind of rub some dirt on it and don't talk about it. At least that's the way that I was raised. Um, women are fantastic advocates for their own health. Fantastic. They have the Susan G. Komen. It's on Oprah. It's on every single channel for, for all of these women's issues. And they do a wonderful, wonderful job of bringing these things to light. Men, men are 
in comparison, awful for the things that, that we, have to, we have to get done. Um, so that makes, that makes identifying it and, and treating it that much more difficult. Um, so it places a, a enormous stress on marriages. A lot of, a lot of uh, you know, what the, what, the, what the wife says is, oh, it doesn't matter to me that much anyway. That's like the last thing a man wants to hear from, from his wife is that, that, that sex doesn't matter to her. Um, so what the husband is thinking is, you know, I just want to be desired. I want to be a man again. And so the results are an unhappy marriage. So a lot of men will say, well, I, I tried the Viagra. It doesn't work. And they kind of give up. Um, don't give up. That's, that's, the medicines are ubiquitous. You can get them from, uh, you can almost get them out of vending machines this day, uh, these days. But it wasn't developed for every single guy who has erectile dysfunction. It was developed for pulmonary hypertension. And they saw that in their younger subjects, they were getting erections. You know, it does work. Absolutely, it works. But you have to have all of that, that list of things that I showed you before. All of those things have to be intact. If one of them is off, those medications may not work. Um, so the treatment options. The first one is do nothing. You can ignore it and go play golf or poker or whatever you're going to do. Second option is this. I used this guy. He was, he was big, a while ago. But that's Smiling Bob for Enzite. They have a car that runs in the, in the Indy 500, I think. So that's this. This is a slide that basically shows the the men who uh, are taking these over count over the counter supplements like the, um, Stay Hard and all of these other different things. So, the idea with this is, with with those types of medications, or if you want to call them medications, or the, the supplements, there, there is a very strong placebo effect. And the placebo effect is really good for about two months. Problem is, these companies will sell you, um, they'll give you a month's supply for free, you get it, it works, and you have to buy a year's supply. And then after that time, after that second month, and the placebo effect has worn off, you're stuck with a bunch of, bunch of stuff that doesn't work, and you've already paid out whole bunch of money. So the treatment options, and there are new ones now, Levitra, Viagra, Cialis. This is what I use first line. If, if, and very rarely do I see men who haven't already been on these medications. Um, my first choice is, is the oral medications. There are very few men who can't take them. You need to look at the history. But um, uh, those people would be some, some patients with specific cardiovascular issues, men who are on nitrates, people who are allergic or who would have a drug interaction are the men who cannot take these. But um, again, usually the men that, that I see in my practice, they've, they've already tried these things, and they're no longer working. Um, next option is something, it's kind of older therapy, but it's a urethral suppository. The, the most common one is called Muse, and it's a prostadil. And that's a medication that will dilate the blood vessels in the penis. And that's a little pellet that goes inside the urethra. Um, you kind of roll it around in there, and after a few minutes, it should, should cause an erection. Um, the downsides to this one is that, number one, it's very, very expensive. Number two, um, it can be painful for, for the man putting it in there, number one. And occasionally, there's been reports of their partner burning because of that medication. Um, there are injection therapies, which I use a great deal in my practice. Um, Again, this is, a, this is a good way not only to try to, to, try to treat somebody, but to, show, to, to find the men who are going to be medically refractory. If you're using this injection therapy and it doesn't work, there are very few things that are going to work. Uh, there's a vacuum assist device. That's a vacuum tube that goes over the penis. You pump the air out, which draws the blood into the vacuum. And then they put a ring around the base of the penis. Then you got to take the vacuum off. And, um, and have sex, and then you take the ring off. It's got to be within 30 to 45 minutes. So they're cumbersome. They're not very romantic. Uh, they do work. Um, I've got a patient who, uh, so the way they work it is, he comes home, and he, and he goes upstairs, and he gets his vacuum out, and he puts it on a nightstand, and he leaves it there. And then he goes downstairs and gets a drink and fixes himself a sandwich, and he goes back upstairs. And if it, and if it's out, he knows he's on for the night. And if it's back in the drawer, then they're, they're, they're off. So that, that's how it works for them. 
So the pump, that's what I do a lot. So in some form of, or another, the penile prosthesis or the penile implant has been around for thousands of years. They found rib bones in the, in the mummies of, of people in China from 5,000 years ago. Um, so as long as there's been a penis and there's been a problem with that penis, some guy has tried to fix it. No, it's not very surprising. Um, so the guy who invented these things is called Brantley Scott. Or his name is Brantley Scott. He's a friend of my dad's, actually, and he died um, uh, in a plane crash not too long ago. Um, so the first ones that were developed and put in were not great. A lot of men were getting infections, and, and they had some problems, but it was offering a great deal of hope. Since that time, they've been perfected. And I mean, these things are, are uh, there's a night and day difference, and they're, they're really wonderful. So about 20,000 American men are implanted every year. And the funny thing is, is there's probably five, well, I don't know, there's probably, you could count on just a few hands, the guys who are doing the vast majority of these surgeries in the United States. So how does this work? All right, this is kind of a, a, a little dark. But basically, same like the, just like the, um, the artificial sphincter, you have a reservoir that goes up in the abdomen away from the, away from the penis, there's two cylinders, one on each side, and then there's a pump. And so there's fluid in the cylinder. When you pump the fluid out, it goes inside the cylinders. It creates a false erection, and then it stays up as long as you want it to. When you hit these two little buttons, it goes back down. The Pro process reverses itself. So very physiologic. Um, it, it looks the same. Uh, somebody with the naked eye couldn't tell the difference if a man was in a locker room or something like that. You couldn't, couldn't tell it was there. Um, so take home points are ED is the repeated inability to achieve the satisfactory erection. It affects probably more than 30 million American men each year. It's got a physical cause and no matter how old you are, it's treatable if, if you want it treated. Um, so again, don't give up. If that's something that you want fixed, it can be fixed. So, George, did you want to do the question and answer series? Okay, these are, these are the questions that I get most commonly. You know, how much does a penile implant or the sphincter hurt? Yeah, they hurt. That's, that's, that's being honest. Yes, you're going to have some pain afterwards, but it's usually pretty limiting. You can take oral pain medications, and uh, in a couple of weeks, you're usually feeling pretty good. It doesn't feel normal. It won't, you won't feel like it's part of you for a year afterwards, and you can get that literature from... Uh, the breast surgeons who do a lot of breast implants. Women who have had breast implants usually report it's at about the year mark where they stop thinking, oh, I've got something inside my body, and it just kind of psychologically becomes, becomes them. Uh, how long does the surgery take? Average surgeon takes about an hour or two, sometimes longer to put an implant. I'm doing mine in about 15 minutes. Um, recovery, I usually, I, you, same day surgery with me, it's not everybody, but same day surgery, go home that night, come back the next day, a drain is removed, you come back in a week, we take out the stitches or the staples. Um, and then it's usually oral sex at three weeks and vaginal penetration at four weeks post-op. So it's pretty quick. That's not everybody, but those are averages. Uh, the incision is only about an inch and it's just typically right above the penis. There's a couple of other approaches that can be taken. But uh, when the hair grows back, usually you can't see the incision. Uh, risk of infection. The risk of infection, um, it, it, my risk of infection is less than 0.6%. Um, if you go to somebody who doesn't do high volume implanting, that number can be as high as five, six, eight percent. Um, another question I get a lot is, is uh, general anesthesia. If they can't have general anesthesia, you can use spinal. I've seen some surgeons on the East Coast using local. That's not something I would ever subject, uh, subject one of my patients to, but it can be done. Um, insurance pays for it. We talked a little bit already about what's the difference between the sphincter and the sling, and if the sling doesn't work, you know, what if it doesn't work? That can be, that can be removed and replaced by something else. So these are just my basic questions that I get a lot. I thought I'd, I'd kind of write them down. George, do you want to <coughs> help out here? And the other thing is, before we get started, um, I, let me ask this question. How many men in here, and you, I get, you don't have to if you don't want to, how many men in here have seen me in the office? Anybody? A couple of people I know. Okay. So if anybody, 
If, you, if anybody in here wants to know how I work things in my office, there are people here who have seen me who will give you, give you a very straight answer. Um, um, so anyway, I, I just want you guys to ask the questions that you want to ask. It doesn't necessarily need to be about these things, but if it were, if say you're going to see a urologist and you want an honest answer, I'll give you, I'll give you at least my version of the most honest answer I can give, so. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Uh, on your website, that's not your face in that website picture, is it? I don't know, I haven't looked at it in a long time. Have you looked at your website? I mean, the one with my name on it is me, but I mean, there might be a guy. No, it's a very old man who's not as attractive as you uh -huh. are, but the impression is that's the guy who's going to come and give the talk. Oh, okay. gotcha. So sorry. You're a good-looking so guy. Sorry to and, just disappoint. And I think you ought to change it because uh, it's, uh, I think it's important for people to aware that you're, you're a, a relatively young person, who, so you're knowledgeable about what's going on in the technology because this is very technology-dependent. Okay, question. Any here? Yes, sir. So, so I have a question. You, you were talking about radical prostatectomy. Yes, sir. The ability or inability to see nerves during that yeah. procedure as a surgeon. So that's, this is an option I'm facing. I was diagnosed eight days ago. Oh, but goodness. so my question to you is about the urinary sphincter part, you know, the incontinence part, sparing that or not seeing that structure. Is yeah. That, something that one can see clearly or not? Okay, so there's, there's a couple of questions there. He was asking me about uh, the ability to visualize the nerves during radical prostatectomy and the ability to spare the, the, the incontinence. So the answer to those questions is, if a man is having good erections prior to surgery, the likelihood is that they'll have good erections after surgery as long as the prostate cancer is not so advanced that uh, you really need to start digging around and taking out uh, a lot of tissue. So um, we do what's called a quote unquote nerve sparing radical prostatectomy. It's a nice guide to how you can get around the nerves but you don't see them. Um, as far as the incontinence goes, um, as long as you can get a good urethral stump, you should be able to spare the, the, um, spare the sphincter. Now, the way that most surgeons are doing it these days are with a robot. I, I will say, robotically, they do a very, very nice job of, of sparing uh, that, that sphincter muscle. So the rates of incontinence uh, with the robotic prostatectomy are very good. But I, I don't do them, but they're, uh, that's, a, that's a good... Okay, L let me just clarify one thing you might be interested. We did a survey of these members here uh, a little over a year and a half ago, and I asked the question, how many have had what's called nerve sparing uh, <laughs> surgery? And nine gentlemen raised their hand. I said, how, how many have found that it works? Raise your hand. No hands went up. Yeah, that's been my experience so, too. Yeah, so I, I just want to supplement that. Uh, any questions? Okay, over here. Uh, you mentioned the drugs, the Viagra, the Cialis, and so on. Do they work after a radical prostatectomy? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> after radical prostatectomy, do Viagra work? Yes, they do. They will do what you ask of them. Um, now, now, the other question is, is will they work? The answer is, I don't know. Because when you're doing a radical prostatectomy, part of the way that you're getting the prostate out is to come across all of those veins and kind of take out the venous drainage of that thing, of the, of the prostate and that area. Now, I, as I had described before, the venous leak, that's very, very important. So every man who gets a radical prostatectomy is probably going to have significant venous leak. More importantly, if a man is getting good erections prior to surgery, they, they should get good erections after surgery. Now, that's again, that's not 100%. If, uh, in my hands, I give patients a 50-50 chance. And I'll tell them that right off the bat. You know, if you got good erections, Preoperatively, uh, pre it's, it's like flipping a coin. You may or may not have good erections post-op. Um, if you don't have good erections, it's not going to happen. So the therapeutic regimen that I put my patients on after surgery is those same medica medications, the Viagra's, Levitra, Cialis, what have you, on a daily dose. You just keep them on it, and that should keep um, at least the blood flow issue uh, better. It should decrease the amount of penile shortening that you're going to get. But um, yeah, it's very, very real. It's uh, erectile dysfunction is something that needs to be discussed on that first visit. 
because um, it's there. Fresh. Yes, Dr. About how long does a turp take to do from beginning to end? And what is the approximate fee or, or cost of a turp? Cash? Like a cash fee for a turp? Cash, credit card, however you want. Okay. Well, I mean, I, we, outside of insurance you're talking about. Yes, just, just as a ballpark. Boy, that's a great question. My, my, what I get, what, sir? Sorry, the, re the question is how much does a turp cost? How long does it take? Uh, every terp is different, but um, I would say for the men that I am doing a transurethral resection of the prostate, they have to have a big enough prostate to, to actually work on. So I just did two uh, yesterday, the other day before, and they each took about an hour. Um, about an hour, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, but and we can discuss that a little bit more. Now, how much does it cost? I've never really been approached about doing a cash terp before, but my fee is I want to say like a thousand bucks. Um, the hospital fee, on the other hand, is you know that's where you're going to run into the fees. It's the anesthesia, the nursing, the hospital, the all, the overnight stay, that sort of stuff, and that can run into the multiple thousands. I'm with Kaiser, and my urologist has made me feel like he wouldn't he wouldn't do a turf on me, mm -hmm. and so. I'm wondering, maybe I need to go outside of Kaiser. I understand. He, he doesn't seem to be a big advocate of that procedure, but yet <clears throat> I have BPH or whatever you want to call it. I have frequent urination. It's a, it's interfered with my quality of life. I can't even go see a two-hour movie at the theater yeah. without worrying myself to death. Oh God, I'm going to miss it. Halfway through, I got to run to the bathroom and miss the best part. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, it, it's affected me a great deal. Yeah, no question. So this gentleman, is, is, his life has been adversely affected by symptoms of a big prostate. Um, I don't know what your urologist has done for you to date. I don't know why that wouldn't be one of the things right up there on the list, but if you're asking for it, uh, the customer is always right. So um, if, unless there's some sort of contraindication where I'd say, oh yeah, I can do this surgery, however all of these horrible things would happen, I, I don't see. To do your terps at. I'm on at Sharp Chula Vista, Scripps Chula Vista, Coronado, um, and a handful of surgery centers in the in the South Bay. But and surgery centers? Some surgery centers, yeah. But the terp, I usually keep my patients overnight, so I prefer to do them in a hospital. In a hospital. Yeah. So the hospital fees you wouldn't be aware of. It's got nothing to do with me. I don't know how much they are. If if you came in my office, the people in the office can usually say, call the hospital and try to give you a ballpark. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, you're welcome. Question here. Um, could you explain what Flomax does as far as the uh, the sure. sector? Uh, does it help empty the bladder or is it retain? So the the question is, how does Flomax work? Flomax is in a class of drugs called uh, alpha blockers. So there there's all these alpha receptors in the prostate and in the bladder and neck. So what an alpha blocker does is you take the medication, it goes in, it hits that receptor and tries to block it from working. So when the alpha receptor is activated, the musculature in the prostate starts to contract and squeeze down along with the bladder neck. So basically that prostate is putting a death grip on the urethra. Urethra is the tube that you urinate through. So the bladder, can I go back? Would that be okay? Okay, so this is as good a picture as any. So here's the urethra, here's the penis, here's the tube that goes out, the, that, that uh, muscle, that sphincter muscle is in here someplace, runs this way. So it's kind of a sheet of tissue and the urethra runs through it and it's a muscle that squeezes down. Here's the prostate and here's the bladder. Now this shows a really small prostate. Oftentimes that prostate can grow into the bladder like this and it gets much, much larger than what this picture would suggest. Uh, that medication works on the muscles in here to relax that, to help empty it. So the reason, the reason that men would have that trouble is that as the bladder fills, if it's having to push against a big obstruction, um, it doesn't empty like it used to. So that's kind of what those medications do. There's another class of drugs called the alpha reductase inhibitors that will actually help to shrink the prostate down. 
but specifically those medications don't do anything to the muscle, that sphincter muscle. They work on the prostate. Could you come in on Cialis for BPH? Yeah, I don't know the, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what the mechanism of action is on, on the Cialis, but it works good. It works really well. Um, so five milligram daily Cialis, this stuff should be in the water. I mean, it's great for everything. <laughs> I'm not kidding, start now. If, you, if your insurance pays for it, take it today. Um, it's good for your heart, it's good for your prostate, it's good for your erections, good for your uh, bragging rights. So, daily dose, daily, big time, unless there's a contraindication. You mentioned that once injections don't work anymore, there's not much you can do. What's happening that causes them not to work? Scar tissue, poor blood flow, nervous issues. There's a million different things that could go on that's not causing it to work. But if you're taking probably this super potent vasoactive drug and you're putting it right in there and the penis doesn't respond, you're probably looking at either a vacuum tube or an implant to get that fixed, depending on, depending on you. Yeah. Right. If you're taking uh, a uh, nitrate drug, you can't take Cialis, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, go ahead, sorry. And the turf, what's the cutoff in terms of size of the prostate? Okay, so there were two questions there. Uh, the first question was about nitrates and the uh, erectile dysfunction drugs. So. The erectile dysfunction drugs can drop your blood pressure. Um, if a man is on nitrates, that's a medication that works on the vasculature of the heart that supplies blood to the heart itself and keeps those blood vessels dilated. So when men get heart uh, chest pain, angina, um, you take that medication and it opens up the blood vessels in the heart and the pain goes away. The problem with, um, with the two medications in combination is it can drop the blood pressure so low that could cause stroke or heart attack or something like that. Um, so those med medications together are very dangerous. The other question was about terp, I'm sorry. I think what you said earlier is, is you can't do a terp oh. if the prostate is below a certain size. No, you could. You could do a terp on anybody if you wanted to. In my hands, I think a terp is good for the men who are you know, heavily sym symptomatic, who have a big median lobe or a part of the prostate that's grown into the bladder. Uh, for anything from, say, 30 grams on up to 150 grams. Beyond that, when they're really big, um, I do an open surgery to get to open it up. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't subject a person to a two, three hour terp. That's, you're talking about a lot of blood loss. And how do you know how big it is before you go and die? Do I mean, answer it? How, how do I know how big the prostate is before I do it? Uh, cystoscopy and a transrectal ultrasound and a physical examination. So I measure everything. Yeah, I got a pretty good idea of what's, what's happening prior, prior to. Some of these questions you can ask after the meeting, okay, if you want more detail. We have a question way in the back there. Could you talk about penile shortening and, and stop? You can be reversed. Okay, the que and are you specifically talking about after surgery or just in general? Okay, um, penile shortening, what can we do about it? How do you stop it? Uh, penile shortening in, is different for different people. So if you're talking about men who have been on the, the hormone, the anti-hormone shots, you're just no longer giving uh, testosterone. Testosterone is, the, is the, the driving force for hormone sensitive, for testosterone sensitive tissues like the penis. So things are gonna, gonna start to shrink up. Um, to try to get that back, you would need to stop that medication. Um, the only other thing that I could say to try to mitigate that would to be on, be on something that's giving you erections uh, more frequently, like a daily dose, uh, daily dose Cialis or a Viagra or Levitra or one of those classes of medications, or testosterone. But they've used a medication in you to get rid of the testosterone, so that's a very uh, slippery slope there. Okay, that's good. So I would be on a PDE-5 immediately. Okay. That the Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, st uh, Staxin, what have you, any of those medications, that would be uh, what I would do. Also using a vacuum tube, uh, you can kind of do some uh, penile rehabilitation. So if you, if you use that to draw blood into those tissues, they should expand. So you'd have to do that several times a day. Um, 
for an extended period of time, but it, it does work. Any other questions over here? Okay, back this, over here. This, uh, uh, you never answered the third question on the sheet I, that I heard anyway about uh, what insurance covers and doesn't cover. The, I'm sorry, in, in what regard, sir? What does insurance cover for any, what? Any of these procedures. Anything? Well, everybody's insurance is different. The uh, question is, what does insurance cover? For Medicare, they'll cover penile implants, slings, sphincters, all of that stuff. Uh, for some other plans, you'll need a prior authorization. For some of the lesser plans, they won't cover any of it because they consider it cosmetic. But the vast majority of insurances do cover these, these things, especially for incontinence. For impotence, I'm not, it's, everybody's different. Okay, question here. If you're on ADT, what's the acceptable testosterone level? Zero, below 50. That's, that's, their, that's their, uh, their goal is to drop the testosterone to castrate levels. So the, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, the question is what's the level of testosterone you wanna be at if you're on uh, the ADT or the, the hormones? And what the doctor is looking for is to castrate you. So that would be a level of t testosterone level of 50 or lower. May, may I comment on that? Uh, I'm on ADT, but I'm not on Lupron. My testosterone is 500. My dihydrotestosterone is 1.0. I'm knocking down my dihydro, not my testosterone. While you're on ADT, is it advisable to take daily Cialis? Yeah, sure. That'll work. Daily Cialis for somebody who's on, uh, on Lupron or any of the, um, the hormones, yes, absolutely, those, those go hand in hand. I'm on that also, Daily Cialis. There's a gentleman in the back here, he's okay. got his hand up for a while. Okay, how about in the back there? Yeah, you. Um, I just had the surgery and I'm doing rehab and there, there was a lot of nerve damage is what I was told. So, you know, I'm using the pump, it, and that brings blood. Does that, act, does that actually do anything to the nerve damage? Is that actually mm -hmm. No, the question is, is, does penile rehabilitation change the fact that you would have nerve damage after prosthetic surgery? The answer is no. Nerves are notoriously slow at growing. You're looking at about a millimeter of growth per year for any given nerve. So if you took out you know, this much of a nerve, um, however many years it takes for those nerves to grow back, it's essentially it's permanent. I mean, if there's nerve damage, uh, the thing that I would use if, if it was me after radical prostatectomy, I would jump straight to penile injection. That's the first thing that I would do to see if, to see if just if the, if the vascular side is working. Question here. Uh, daily Cialis, as you suggest, what if you have a couple of stents in your heart? Well, that's screw, screw, screw. Question is stents, uh, heart stents and Cialis. No, that should be a-okay. Question here. Uh, I, I, my uh, my uh, radiologist uh, wanted me to uh, check my uh, penis out. He wanted to see if he could put a dye in it. He ran into a, he said, my urethra and bent. And so he wants me to see a, he wants me to see a <coughs> urologist. There might be a stricture yeah. in my uh, urethra. What, what would that involve? What would be the situation there? Okay, patient is, er, I'm sorry, that's out of habit. This, this gentleman is asking uh, about urethral stricture disease, which is scar tissue in this tube. Um, so scar tissue in the tube, it's different for everybody, but when there's sc severe scarring, how to fix that? Is that the question? Yeah, I'm just wondering. What do you do? I have to ask you a lot of you have any concern that there might be a stricture there? Yeah, I would do a cysto, and you just look through this tube to the, all the way into the bladder and you can see anything. If it's really bad, they might do a test called a retrograde urethrogram or a rug where they squirt dye through the penis into the bladder and they use a... That's what he was trying to do. He couldn't get, he couldn't get through. He got a little dye through. He was having difficulty getting the... Ah, I would do a cysto. And then uh, I, do, I do urethral work. Uh, there's a woman, her name is uh, a physician, surgeon, Jill Buckley at UCSD who does 
That's basically all she does. She does a great job at reconstruction. There's another doc in the area. I don't know him personally, but I think he trained in reconstruction. His name is Jason Siegel. Younger guy, he's like seven feet tall. I can't miss him. So, but uh, that's that's something I do too. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Any question? Do you have a program that you recommend to patients that are going to have thoracic prostatectomy to help maintain continence? Something they can do before and after. It's an excellent question. Um, it's one of the best questions I've ever heard. Uh, is there a program that I would put men on prior to radical prostatectomy to maintain continence? Um, well, yeah, Kegels exercises, and if you really want to get at it, you would, I would probably send somebody to a physical therapist or do pelvic floor. Having said that, you know, the surgery is what it is. It's going to be what it's going to be. So. You could do all the exercises in the world and do the, your very, very best, but if that doc, that surgeon has to take that muscle or does take that muscle or what have you, that's that. It's not, it's not you know, once, once the muscle is gone, that's your barrier to stop leaking. So, um, but yeah, I would say if you can preoperatively start doing Kegels exercises and even see a, 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 a physical therapist who, who specializes in pelvic floor, absolutely. It's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking it. Question back there. Yeah, I'm very confused about the uh, testosterone uh, impacts on your on your cancer. Um, I Me too. When, 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 yes, when I first got an enlarged <laughs> prostate, uh, one of the doctors suggested putting me on finasteride to shrink my my prostate. But we had another doctor here from, I think, Alvarado Hospital who came in and said it's a very bad thing to do because it, sh because it decreases your dihydrotestosterone, and that creates big problems. So, you know, so, so my question is, which is it, do you need less testosterone or less dihydrotestosterone, and what is the impact that it has on, so on your prostate? You've been diagnosed with, diagnosed with prostate cancer, is that correct? Okay, you're on active surveillance. All right. So say you were to get a surgery and you come back and your PSA is zero. Um, what in your testosterone is, and this is a, this, I, I love this question because this is one that the, the vast majority of the doctor, the surgeons or whomever don't answer. So in my mind, um, if you've been treated for your prostate cancer, and your PSA, or excuse, and your PSA is zero. You're you're happy with your treatment, so on and so forth. And your and your testosterone is five, six, seven hundred. How many of those men did the doctor suggest that you go back and put them on hormones? The answer is zero, because they've treated their prostate cancer, right? So there's all these men in the world with these normal testosterones who have prostate cancer and underwent some other form of therapy. If testosterone is so dangerous. Why wouldn't you castrate everybody? The answer is because the, 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 uh, the studies that were done on testosterone and prostate cancer originally were done in dogs, and the, and the vast majority of what we have is garbage. Um, so people are afraid of putting their patients on testosterone because they think it's going to make the, the, the prostate cancer just go ballistic. Well, that's not what we've seen in recent studies. So if you're on active surveillance, you can be on testosterone. Just watch your watch your PSA. You know, I mean, if you're if it gets that's the whole point of of active surveillance. If you're on something, maybe you want to get your biopsy a little sooner. I wouldn't say turn your back on it. I'm not going to say forget about it. I'm not saying that there's no validity to the fact that testosterone and prostate cancer can act in concert. But I I would have a I I, I guess once this all gets parsed out, when you got guys from universities maybe 100 years from now who look at us like idiots and they know all the answers. What I'm going to guess is that there are two different types uh, genetically of prostate cancer. There's the kind that you've got, and then there's the kind that another guy gets where the PSA rages through him like, or the, the prostate cancer rages through like wildfire. I would have to say that in that man, the t it, is it is very, very sensitive to, tes to testosterone. And some of these other men, I'll bet you it's not. But it's got one's got nothing to do with the other, so I don't castrate my patients just because. In point of fact, I castrate very, very few. Um, you know, and and the other thing is, if a man is dying from prostate cancer and you know it, and you're putting him on uh, these um, Luprons and 
trying to get rid of the testosterone, you're also going to make them feel like garbage. So um, a lot of things that happen in my business, those, there's a guys who will have these hormone refractory prostate cancer. Regardless of you giving them the, the Lupron or whatever, what have you, the Zolidex, the PSA continues to rise. And the radiation docs, not, not everybody, I mean, please don't think that I'm painting all of my colleagues with this broad of a brush, but the vast majority of other urologists, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists will say, keep him on that medication. And I always ask, why? And they say, well, it's probably better. So there's no book written, there's no study that's shown me that, that that's just you know, destroying this guy's sex life and making his uh, increasing bone loss and taking away his libido and taking away his, his desire to live, frankly, is, um, is really working. Now there are men who get ADT and they do really, really well. So I have, I have a follow-up question to your question, which he asked about dihydro. Uh, do, we, do you want to comment on dihydro uh, uh, I don't have the slide, but basically what George is talking about is the, is the steroid, steroidogenesis pathway. So if you look at this, there's another slide. You could look it up on, you know what? I can look it up, and I'm going <laughs> to. This is fancy. Um, give me just a moment here. Not my dog. Not a real dog. Come on, go to Google. Go to Google. There we go. This, oh, come on. There's the answer. Yeah, there's your answer. Um, okay, so let me. Yeah, is everybody clear as to what we're doing? Okay, so I'm going to try to get, all right, there we go. It's very clear. All right, up top left is cholesterol. These are all different parts of the body, these big, things are different parts of the body. What did I do with this? Okay, so you've got cholesterol, your body does a whole bunch of other things to it, boom, 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 and you get down to this molecule here, which is testosterone. So 5-alpha reductase medications, the, the, thing, uh, the thing that changes testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, which is the active metabolite of testosterone in the body. So is a medic is medication is a is an enzyme called 5 alpha reductase. So some smart guy thought, okay, if I block this, if testosterone causes the prostate to get bigger, if I block this, then I can shrink the prostate because this is the active metabolite. So dihydrotestosterone what George was talking about is not I'm assuming you're talking about finasteride. Is that the your ADT? There have been a bunch of studies done on it that don't show that um, it really has any effect, uh, efficacy on, on lifespan or that it works as a chemoprophylaxis against prostate cancer. That's not to say don't do it. It's to say that I don't know. So, and then the other, the other pathway is when you start to break down testosterone, it goes into two things. This thing here is estradiol. That's estrogen. So you may notice guys who are on testosterone therapy starting to get man boobs. That's because of this. So if you want to drop this down, then they have to be on um, a different medication uh, to, block the, to block the estrogen. We could spend three hours on this, but I won't. So that's that. Uh, let me just comment, because uh, I had uh, prostate cancer. I've had prostate cancer 18 years. And after 10 years, my radiation failed, and I got prostate cancer again. My PSA went to 14. I came to this meeting despite my urologist saying they're a bunch of whiners. And the opportunity of meeting that gentleman over there, Gene, and also Lyle. And uh, I got a stroke as a result of, uh, of uh, having a shot of Lupron. I'm one of the 5% that can't take it. 5% can have a heart condition. So what am I going to do? And, and these gentlemen and the doctors I talked to said, okay, take Casadex and Avidart. And I have been taking that for over six years. I have very aggressive cancer. I got uh, a, a 
Gleason of eight that's in the seminal vesicles, and I've been on Casadex and Abadar, and it keeps my PSA is is 1.0 stable. My uh, t testosterone is 500. My dihydro is 1.0. And that's what works for me, and it works for several others. I'm not saying that's for you, but that's what works for me. And uh, because I've been told that dihydro is really the potent stuff that's bad for you on prostate cancer. Okay, let's go back here. Any questions? Any questions here? Yes. Uh, how do you counteract muscle mass loss? Um, from the ADT? I don't know that you can. Uh, that's a great question. Testosterone is something, there's a reason God put it in there. Um, it's, the, it's something we need, men and women. Um, and um, how do you reduce muscle loss? Uh, lifting weights and load-bearing exercise is the most important thing that you can do. It'll help your bone and it'll help it'll help your muscle, but that's a, that's, a, that's a tough thing to counteract. Anybody who's been on it will tell you the same thing. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rob you of your, of your uh, lean muscle mass. Absolutely. Go for it. I, I, don't know, I don't know that it works, but I've, a million people can't be wrong. They, uh, I just don't know what the side effects are, but they, you know what? If it was me, I'd be checking everything else out. Absolutely. Okay, you've already had two. Uh, anybody hadn't had a, <laughs> a, a question today? Okay, you, sir. And I'll stick around too. Don't 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 worry we'll about come it. We'll back to you, but let's first timer. I just wanted to follow. Up. You mentioned uh, there was a question earlier about uh, fighting the uh, shortening of the penis. And yeah. After after I wanted to ask about after surgery. Uh, you suggested uh, pump. Oh. As, a, as, as a way of fighting that, can that also, does that also help in the quality of an erection and making it harder? And uh, the other thing is, uh, could uh, testosterone be a, be a possibility there? But you know, I know like in my case, uh, like I did have rapidly evolving cancer, you know, at 59. And so uh, every doctor I consulted said, in your case, you do need surgery, you know, so. I'm thinking that maybe uh, that falls into what, what you said, that there might be there, in that case, a link between testosterone and that, that kind of uh, more aggressive cancer. So maybe that should be avoided, you know, testosterone. Sure. Um, well, that, that's a good question. If you've had surgery and your PSAs have dropped to nothing, I mean, I would be on testosterone. That's, yeah. I mean, it's something that I would do. I prescribe it uh, to tons of my patients and a lot of my patients have prostate cancer you know I'm not afraid of it and I'm not afraid to explore things with my patients as long as we both understand that there's there's a intangible risk for a lot of these things and that's why it's so important to follow up and have a good convert have a have a good relationship with your doctor text message email what have you hey you know I'm worried about this what do you think so you know I'm not gonna have all the answers I, I'm, I'm not um, and that's where I feel like uh, we, as doctors, have done ourselves a disservice. We're, we're afraid to stand up in front of a room full of people and say, I don't know. You know, these are things that I don't know. As far as, as, far as uh, penile shortening, this device, and I don't know that it's this device, but one like it, is the only one that's been uh, shown to be uh, effective through clinical trials at increasing penile length and penile girth. So this is a stretching device. It needs to be worn for like six hours a day. Um, this side sits against the body. This thing clamps down to the head of the penis, and, the, and these, these things extend the, the length of the penis. The vacuum devices are good for vascular rehabilitation and for, for, for nerve issues. But if you're specifically talking about length issues, it would be something like this. There's surgery for it, but you don't want it. No. The young lady in the back. Yeah. Okay, a question in the back here. Um, yeah, back to your other point about um, what you say is going to be in 100 years that yeah. you probably think that this will be this and this will be that. If a person has a low testosterone going into um, any kind of treatment, 
then do you say, therefore, the chances are that giving that person testosterone along with treatment wouldn't be contraindicated? It's a great question. It's the, the question specifically about prostate cancer. Yeah, we, I see that very, very commonly as men with low testosterone who get diagnosed with prostate cancer. That's extremely counterintuitive, right? Because shouldn't it be the men with this, you know, these huge high levels of testosterone should be the ones getting prostate cancer. And I've, you know, I do a lot of sexual medicine in my office and I'm always getting for, for I, I write on this sheet and hand it to the ladies. I just write sex labs. And so that's um, CBC, CMP, FSH, LH, uh, to free and total testosterone, something called an SHBG, and always a PSA. And it's not because I'm searching for prostate cancer, but my patients are entrusted to me, and they entrust me with their, with their lives, essentially. So I need to follow everything that's going to be important to follow up on that, on that man. So if I'm gonna be giving him testosterone, regardless of my feelings about whether or not it's dangerous, there's a big question mark there. So that's something that I always follow. Um, but you're absolutely right. I see a lot of men with low testosterones that, uh, that get diagnosed with prostate cancer. There was one study that showed that men with low testosterone who get prostate cancers often have a more uh, aggressive form of the disease. And so um, that's just one study in one part of the world on you know, one group of men. But um, yeah, that's, that's completely completely counterintuitive and one wouldn't think that so basically to make those decisions you want to see what comes out on the pathology after surgery and how they respond to therapy and if the PSA drops to nothing and they've been that way for a year or two treat them I mean that's low testosterone is just as just as bad as any other you know like having a low hemoglobin you know we don't we don't ignore anemia okay question here a man is on ADT, can estrogen supplementation be used safely to help maintain bone health and reduce side effects like hot flashes and things like that? Um, I don't know. I've never seen, I've never done it myself. I think probably, but I don't, I don't know. Okay, you get to ask another one. Uh, this gentleman right over here asked you about the surgery and the follow-on of uh, Kegel and some other things. If you're having, you're going to have uh, IMRT. Mm -hmm. Is 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 Would that you do the that? same answer? The question was um, should it right? The question was does would you put somebody on a pre-radiation therapy for urinary incontinence? Answer is no, because radiation doesn't necessarily cause incontinence because you're not removing any of those structures. Usually it's the opposite. It usually makes it much more difficult for a man to urinate because of the swelling, the swelling of the prostate and possibly scar tissue. So I had a radical prostatectomy, but one side was a wide excision and the other side the nerve was supposedly spared. But when you go and read about Recovery from that, everything says bilateral nerve sparing. Do you have what experience do you have with the unilateral? I have no experience. Um, the question is, what experience do I have with a unilateral nerve sparing surgery? And I'll just go back to my earlier points. I've never seen a nerve in my life, so I don't write nerve sparing into my operative reports ever. So my personal experience with nerve sparing in general is is pretty limited. And the only the only thing that I can say is I. You know, I'm not the greatest human being, but I try to be honest in what I do and say to people, and I try not to write things down on a piece of paper that just simply aren't true. I mean, if I didn't do a radical uh, nerve sparing radical prostatectomy, you know, I'm not going to write it down. So uh, the only guy that I would know that would have that information would be something from Walsh at uh, Johns Hopkins, and I can I can look for you, and I can try to look that stuff up, but. I, I know how to fix it. Uh, I don't necessarily know the steps before that. I can only speak to my personal experience. Okay, Chuck. With the penile implant, do you get a, a length similar to what you had before? Question or is, is it I'm much sorry. less? 
the question is, is can we spare length with a penile implant? It, it, that's a good question. Now, you shouldn't, if you go to somebody who's doing a good job, they, you probably shouldn't lose too much length. You're going to lose a little bit, but most men are thinking back to when they were, say, 18 years old. So one of the, one of the first things I do with the men in the office is uh, stretch, uh, stretch test. Have them stand up and you hold the head of the penis and you stretch it as far out from the body as possible. And you take a measurement right there in the room. So that's what you're going to get post-op. I can't make it bigger than that. Um, now, if men are really concerned about penile length prior to, uh, prior to surgery, then you would want to do something like this, because that can add on an inch or so. Um, it's not dramatic, but it, but it does work. So what we're looking for with, with penile implants is the man who really wants that sexual restorative surgery. It's not, it's not penile enhancement. It's, it's something to bring back the, the function, not necessarily the, the size. You can lose a little bit of length. I try to mitigate that as much as I, as much as I can. Okay. Okay, question there. George, I'm still a little confused about the dihydrotestosterone. We had another doctor here from Alvarado Hospital, Dr. Goldstein, I think was his name. Erwin Goldstein, yep. He said it's, who said it was very bad to lower your dihydrotestosterone for your body. In fact, he made a comment that it might be, the effects might be irreversible. Now, in George's case, his is low and it's good for him. So I'm, I'm just curious, is it good or bad to lower your dihydrotestosterone? It depends on who you are, I guess. I mean, if somebody's got, if somebody's got a nasty uh, prostate cancer and you think that the risk of lowering the dihydrotestosterone is less than what would happen, the sequelae of a nasty uh, life-altering cancer, then you lower it. And if, 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 like, I wouldn't do it if I didn't have to, let me put it that way. Um, you know, I wouldn't have any kind of surgery if I didn't have to do it. So what's better, what's better is, yeah, don't, you know, don't, don't lower it, but don't know. Thank you. Hey, over here. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a little confused. What is the correlation of high testosterone levels with pro a prostate cancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the question is, what, what is the correlation between high testosterone and prostate cancer levels? That could be a three-hour lecture in and of itself. Um, there were some studies that were done many, many years ago on testosterone showing that um, testosterone can activate and or make prostate cancer work. Those studies were done in dogs. Since then, it has, become, uh, it has become gospel, and doctors have hung on to that, and that's what we've used from here on out. Now, I cannot say that it's not, there's not truth in it, but the studies that were done were not very good studies. So um, there, have been, there has been study after study after study after study showing that a normal testosterone level does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. Now, there's nobody that's going to subject themselves, other than maybe bodybuilders, um, to huge levels of testosterone and then go back in and get checked for prostate cancer. But in the literature that is out there, it does not suggest that using testosterone causes prostate cancer. Say, because my level is uh, between 900 and 1,000. Okay, good. And I don't know if good or bad, you know. But good, good. Good. But I, I had if to, you, well, they, they suggested that I... Uh, if you want to learn more about this, on our website, there's a very good article written by a doctor who was specializing in low testosterone and found out they had a high degree of prostate cancer. And he started talking about... Is that Morgan Taylor? Abe Morgan Taylor? I, I'm not sure. But he talked at, at the urology convention, and he got almost booed out because this is against the theory. So he, what he did, he was the original uh, creator of that theory of testosterone causing uh, uh, prostate cancer is Dr. Hubble, who won a Nobel Prize for that. But he went to the Harvard Medical School Library to look up Dr. Uh, Hubble's paper back in, it was written in 1941. And he found out some, that it was only based on three patients. One had already been castrated. The second was uh, not valid. So it was based on one patient that his theory was generated. Garbage well, in, been, garbage out. It's, it's been in, uh, implanted, if you will, in the field of urology. This is my understanding. 
No, you're, that, you're right. That, so, so it is controversial, and that's why it's, everybody wants to give me Lupron to knock down testosterone, and I say I can't take it. And, and so I'm, I'm over here. I track not, my PSA tracks dihydro, not testosterone. Well, because if, my P, if my dihydro is low, my PSA is low. Okay. So, say, I, I'm against basic theory, particularly in San Diego. Up in L.A., there's a little more openness about Did you, the dihydro. Were you biopsied with the PSA 27? I just had a biopsy, uh, and I don't know the results yet, because oh, right. I had it yesterday. And, you know, I, and they told me that I should get a biopsy because my PSA was yeah, so I high. And, and along, alongside that, my testosterone level was high as well. Yeah, you, yeah I get, so now I understand the question a little bit better. You have a high PSA and a high testosterone. Should you lower your testosterone? The answer is no. Leave it alone. No, no, I'm not going to touch it. Yeah, don't touch it. You're, you're, you're lucky. Leave it where it is. Uh, back there. Yes. The one thing I wanted to say, um, my husband, he was diagnosed in January. His PSA never reflected the level of cancer that he had in him. So I just want to say he had lots of symptoms, but um, they weren't even going to biopsy him because his PSA wasn't that high, even though they did a digital and he had a positive digital exam. It ends up he has a nine on the Gleason score when we did the Gleason score. And we've had a total prostatectomy, and there's still some in the bladder. Yeah, can I, can I ask you a question? So yeah. you had a positive digital rectal examination, meaning there was a lump on the exam, and they did not want to biopsy him? I uh, gave it an I won't tell you where I'm from. That's fine, fair enough. Uh, they, uh, he left it up to my husband. I wasn't there on the exam, so I said, of course you're going to have a biopsy, which yeah. he did have, which he had a Gleason score of nine, at seven to nine, and when they did do the total prostatectomy, um, it was already in his yeah. bladder. And now what we're facing is now he said, uh, Yeah, so we, 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 So now we've had his um, PSA is uh, one eight now, but it never was as high as even. I'm sorry, the PSA is 1.8, did you say? Now, which isn't good. and. But he's, well, I won't even go into that. Um, may I ask you a, a question? Um, can, I, can I speak about your husband's situation as if he was my patient? And would, would that be okay with you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, if I, if I saw any patient who came to me with regardless of their PSA, PSA is a test, you know? Test is an approximation of an approximation of an approximation. It's a, te it's a test, you know? I mean, they're not, they're not perfect. Um, if I... If I had a digital rectal examination on a patient and they would and they had a positive positive uh, they had a lump on the prostate, you absolutely biopsy them. There's you, there's no doubt you just do that. Now, having said that, if you have a patient who's got a Gleason nine prostate cancer, that's way up there. Um, and does everybody know what the Gleason sum is? Most more or less, okay? It's two numbers added together to give us a, a sum total. It starts at two, goes up to 10. We never see two, it usually starts at six. Moderate grade is six sevens, five six sevens, high grade eight, nine, 10. So with any of my patients who have a Gleason nine, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about, the two different biologically active prostate cancers. If your PSA, if your, if your Gleason sum is a nine, you've got a very bad actor. Those are the men that I would put on, uh, I would throw the kitchen sink at. I probably wouldn't operate on them. That's just my opinion, because I don't know that I'm gonna be able to get that out unless the prostate, the volume of the prostate is huge and causing other symptoms and so on and so forth. Um, I, I can almost guarantee going into it that I'm not gonna be able to get out all of that cancer. I'll do it if somebody asks me to do it and they say, Doc, I, you know, I, this is what's gonna make me feel best. I'd say, okay, well, we're gonna do this, but please know going into it, I don't think I'm gonna get it all. You know, We need to probably get, so that's a person I would have on on uh, Lupron, I would do I would do uh, surgery and, and and radiation. Yeah, no question. Right. Well, we're right now. I'm sorry to make this personal, but um, right no. now, when they, he has said don't do radiation. We know there's more left, and he was saying not to do radiation. Who? The your urologist said I, don't radiate. Yeah. 
with positive margins. Yeah. Change your doctor. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, that, that, can't, that can't go. I'm glad you asked the question. Wait, we got time for two more questions. Yes. The comment, I, first I heard you say I would not do surgery, and then you said I'd throw the kitchen sink and do surgery. And, and if reduce. the patient wanted it. Oh, thank you. We asked for the surgery. Understood, and that happens, and that's, that's, that's okay. That's, that's fine. I just. With the suggestion to get your testosterone tested, what is the procedure for the test? What is, it, what is the test itself? The, uh, what's the testosterone test? The blood test. Just a blood test, two minutes. That's another good question. I'm sure there are several, but they basically measure the free and total testosterone in the, in the body. And there's another test, a dihydrotestosterone test, which is kind of a, a backdoor way of getting at that number. Yes. How much the bowel pain does ADP do to the tumor? <sighs> You guys ask tough questions. Um, I a lot. I don't know the uh, how much. How much will you shrink the prostate with ADT in three to six months? Uh, significantly, and I only know that because my radiation docs, who I send my patients to, often request anywhere from six months to two years of of uh, ADT just in order to get the prostate shrunk down so they can make their field smaller so their, for their treatment is more effective. But me personally, I don't know in grams how much you could shrink a 100 gram prostate down to say a 20 gram prostate and how long that process took. I, I don't know, I'm sorry. Okay, what else bunch. could you go to spend a couple of hours talking about uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, penile shortening and things like that <laughs> in a very frank and open manner? I want to compliment you with your questions and also with the doctor's frankness and so forth. So thank you very much.